Hi, I'm Moses Suarez, uh, making a response to Jerry Boschman, uh, author of a book called uh, Hope Beyond Hell, uh, and a video that he made called Why Rob Bell's uh, Love Wins uh, is Not Universalism. So a couple of things that need to be, I guess, hammered up first. Uh, one, he says that most people think of universalism as a as a sort of uh, a pluralism, and that, that might be true in, in, in some places, as I understand most other people's version of, uh, of universalism is that God will, will win them over uh, eventually in one sense, kind of just like what, what Rob Bell wins. Either way, the idea behind universalism where most, uh, I guess, evangelical uh, Christians have a problem with universalism is that, uh, it just the Bible doesn't teach it. Uh, I know there's a lot of passages that are that are taken way out of context. Uh, it seems, um, you know, like every knee shall bow and and every tongue confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you know, they might take that to mean what well, you see. It says every, you know, and therefore, you know, uh, it means in a salvific way. You know, people can be made to uh, to bow uh, uh, to someone in a submissive way and not necessarily. Uh, in a willful way of uh, of acceptance, and so there's other ideas that that need to be taken into consideration there when when looking at those passages that seem to imply universalism. Um, the other thing is that there's clear texts uh, in the Bible <clears throat> that speak about people who just aren't going to be saved. Um, you see Jesus talking about uh, uh, people who are on the wide path of destruction. Uh, you see people whom Jesus is going to say on the last day, depart from me, I never knew you. Um, you know, there's there's pastors like that and, and, and different parables uh, where Jesus speaks about people being uh, consciously tormented for eternity where the worm dies not. Um, those are texts that need to be taken into serious consideration. Um, so I, I don't necessarily take it as pluralism, but uh, it, it, the concept of universalism, period, is is tough to reconcile with scriptures. Not with my not with my human emotions. Indeed, that would be something awesome, uh, you know, for everybody to be saved. And in fact, uh, uh, there are certain cults that do have uh, that sort of you know some sort of doctrine of universalism, but I just don't see it in scripture. Uh, one passage that he does take, uh, John twelve thirty two, which says, "I will draw all men unto me." Uh, and he says, you know, drag, and yes, it is the Greek word, uh, helko, uh, there. But in context, what, uh, what Jesus is talking about is that he's going to bring not only Jews, but he's going to bring Gentiles. And so other translations have put that as either all peoples or uh, even all kinds of peoples. Uh, and that's the sense that we want to take from there, is that Jesus didn't come just to save the Jews only, but he came to save all kinds of peoples uh, and Revelation kind of comments on this um, uh, people from every tribe, every race, every tongue and every nation. Uh, I'm under the clock here so uh, I'm gonna try to try to do this real quick. Okay here we go so moving on. Okay uh, one other point that I that I didn't really appreciate he said that other people uh, have shared the sort of view and he mentions irresistible grace uh, with Rob's, with Rob Bell's, uh, or as synonymous in one sense with Rob Bell's belief, that is incorrect. Uh, as reformed myself, uh, irresistible grace is not the teaching that God is going to draw everybody and regenerate them uh, so that they are all born again. No, the doctrine of irresistible grace is the teaching that those whom God has elected from the foundation of the world, that those God will regenerate so that they can place their faith in Jesus Christ, believe in the gospel, and they will uh, repent unto eternal life. Um, that is the doctrine of irresistible grace. It is not intended to say that everybody uh, without discrimination is going to be saved, but rather only those whom God intends to save uh, will be saved. So uh, there is definitely an error there. Um, so I guess the, one of the bigger things you know, with this, with this type of doctrine is what it does for evangelism. Now, you know, I can appreciate Jerry. He, he's a, a, you know, he he did missions work and stuff like that. But if this doctrine really sets in to where we can accept Jesus now or accept him later, there is no motivation 
at least not a, not a logically connected one. There is no motivation to go out and do missions work. There is no the urgency. I, I, I guess really is what I should say. There is no urgency to get missions. There is no there is no real reason to see people as perishing in the world today. If eventually at some point uh, in their uh, immortal life they will be able to accept Christ. Uh, there, there's no sense of urgency to do that. There's no sense of urgency to bring social relief or social justice anywhere in the world, even, you know, that Rob Bell says that he wants so that we can bring heaven on earth. Why do those sorts of things if at some point we're all going to be reconciled, all things will be made right, you know, there's no, there's almost no point of doing that. Uh, again, just at least there's not a connection for that urgency. Uh, to do that and again the scary part here is if these men are wrong uh, that's really going to jeopardize the salvation of a lot of souls uh, that should have heard the gospel that needed to hear the gospel and no urgency was placed you know in our own hearts um, to get that out to them so um, he asked you know it, it, who is not repulsed by such a horrid doctrine, uh, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, people who believe in it are, you know, everybody is. It, it really is a horrible thing. But what stands out, uh, or what is the final determiner of doctrine, is not us. It's not what we feel. It's scripture. And so there's just a couple of passages of scripture that I want to bring out, and I'm gonna have to go to the Greek for this because this is where we're gonna need to see, uh, or at least some uh, some similar phrases. But uh, in Revelation. Okay, so let's go to Revelation uh, 20, 10 first, and it, and it talks about uh, when Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire, it says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beasts and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The Greek word there, uh, forever and ever, is uh, aeonas ton aeonon. Okay? Uh, forever of forever, okay, basically, or the ages of ages, uh, uh, in, in some more literal ways. Um, the expression is a very strong one for eternity, okay. The same word is used in Revelation 7.12, okay, and in Revelation 7.12 we read this, and this is in, in, in uh, I'll just read it. Okay, so the the elders and the living creatures, they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. In the Greek, it's, just, it's the same expression. Ionios ton Ionon. Okay, uh, I might be misreading that, but... <laughs> Okay, same exact expression, and we're also going to find that same expression in Revelation uh, 4.10. And notice what this is describing now with those same words. In Revelation 4.10. Okay, found it there in the Greek. And this one is actually in reference to God now. Actually, in 4 9, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Uh, the, the Greek word there, uh, in both instances, aonios ton aonion, and then also in 10, aonios ton aonion. So what we need to see here is that the expression um, Ionos ton Ionon is applied to the eternal nature of God. It's to the worship of God. And it's also applied to the eternal nature of the punishment that the devil and his angels receive. That same fire that was prepared for the devil and angels in Matthew 25, uh, uh, where, where, where the sheep and the goat are separated, it said that the goats 
were thrown into the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels um, into eternal punishment. Um, according to the Bible, that expression forever and ever is it's the same one applied to the eternal nature of God that's supposed to be ascribed to the kind of worship that God is supposed to receive forever and ever. God is supposed to receive worship forever and ever. Eternal punishment uh, is is fact, and, and again, I know this is a um, it's a disturbing doctrine. It's a disturbing teaching. Um, other commentators on these things have basically said that that's the point: is that it's meant to be disturbing, so that we can one, we need to recognize the nature of sin. We need to recognize how horrific it is based on the consequences that it produces. You know, we we think we can we we can get away in life you know, uh, saying little white lies and, 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 and things like that, but what we really need to see with such a punishment is the extent to which sin robs God of His glory, the extent to which our sin hurts God, the extent to which uh, our, our sin cost God, His only Son, that He had to come and die. That That's how um, offensive, how wicked, how horrible sin is. And we need to see that. The other thing that we need to see is that we need to understand that in that, uh, you know, in, in in seeing how horrific sin is, we need to see also how great God is. Uh, we don't grasp all the time, you know, how holy is God. Yeah, yeah God is holy. We can just kind of throw around the idea, but you know, it's easy for us to be just like Aaron's sons, or maybe even just like Uzzah. You know, uh, reaching to steady out the ark and, you know, Aaron's son's offering strange fire. You know, eh, we're having a good time. God is good. All right, let's burn whatever God didn't want us to burn. And they offered strange fire and God shot fire straight down from heaven and destroyed them. Uzzah, I mean, trying to do, you know, protect the holy thing, trying to protect the ark from falling on the ground. Um, didn't realize how, you know, how sinful he was and how holy God was. And thinking that he could reach out to the holy things uh, and touch them. Uh, you know, Uzzah found out differently about, about God's holiness, and um, you know, we need to have that understanding. We need to have that encounter with the holiness of God. You know, just like Isaiah, when when he saw the King, you know, sitting on the throne, who the train of his robe filled the temple. Uh, the first thing Isaiah said, "Woe is me! For I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips." Uh, he encountered God's holiness. Uh, and it shook him to the very core of how sinful he was. And, and you, you have to think, that's in Isaiah 6, you know, and previously in the other chapters, you know, he's already prophesying, he's doing, he's doing well. And, you know, it, 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 it was later, you know, that he just, he was overwhelmed um, by God's holiness, and God's holiness overwhelmed him with the sense uh, of his own sin and how how wicked he was, you know, he didn't go. It went from just having a vague general understanding of you know, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm a sinner, whatever. To oh, whoa, I, I am, I am far more wicked and far more vile than I ever thought I was. And God is far more holy uh, and far more precious uh, than I had conceived of Him um, to be. And so that is a. Uh, those things are important to see. Yes, this is a, a horrific doctrine. Um, it's scary to preach on. I, for whatever reason, um, Mr. Boschman and, and even Rob Bell tend to paint pictures of everybody who doesn't believe as they do, as though all we do is preach about hell. Um, to be quite honest with you, I've never put out a blog or videos on the teaching of hell until this issue came up. You know, I, I don't go around personally ranting and raving about it. The preachers that I listen to, they don't go about ranting and raving on it. You know, they do share the good news. They do share the gospel. But what is that gospel? Is the gospel nobody's going to hell? No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is, is that as far as we were in our wickedness, Jesus Christ, God, <laughs> came down. He humbled himself. Uh, he humbled himself. He took on the form of a man. He lived out a perfect life. He suffered in this life. And he knows what it's like to, to endure our suffering, and he took on the ultimate suffering that we deserved. He took on the very real pains of hell. And again, this is what gave Jesus authority to talk about hell the most in the Bible. It's because he knows. Jesus knows what hell is. Jesus experienced it 
firsthand. And, and again, for people like Rob Bell to say, well, nobody really knows, you know, nobody's been there and back. Yes, somebody has. Jesus Christ has been there and back. Okay? And it, what he says about it pretty much settles the issue. So, um, the issue here, again, it's not going to be, well, what conveys to my feelings? What could make, you know, good news better news? You know, as if as if the gospel wasn't good enough. You know, Christ coming and dying for our sins and giving us His righteousness, rising to life as proof that God the Father had accepted His sacrifice. Uh, there, there is the gospel. You know, and all God asks us to do is to believe that. <laughs> we don't got to work for it. We just have to believe it. That's the good news. But some people want to try to make better news than God has has already made, and uh, I, I see that stepping too far, uh, definitely stepping too far. So, you know, what is truly good news? What the Bible says is, you know, that through faith, through faith alone, we can be justified before God. And so the big issue here, and I, I think it's pretty much been settled, because if, uh, logically speaking, if hell is not forever and ever, Neither is the worship that is going to be ascribed to God, and neither is God eternal. Neither is God himself forever and ever. So you have to take your pick. If you're going to be consistent with what you say hell is, as far as the meaning of forever and ever, be consistent and apply that to the worship that's supposed to be ascribed to God and the very eternal nature of God himself. So I, I think the scriptures speak clearly. Uh, on this issue, I, I, there is no temporary hell. Um, once you're in, it's forever and ever. Um, I hope that that will prompt us to share the good news uh, and not keep it to ourselves. I hope that that uh, creates an urgency and it's that you know what I, you need to hear this. I need to tell you. I mean, if the house was on fire, you wouldn't say, "Ah, <laughs> let them burn off. Ah, be resurrected later." Something. No, you, you tell people. You get them out of the house.